Hi everyone. In this video, I want to talk about linear impact. So linear impact is when we uh, apply a force quickly to a rigid body and we're doing so in a, in a linear sense uh, rather than say rotational. So when we w need an example to, to talk through this, uh, probably the easiest one is to say we have a, a weight and we drop it from some height h and it's going to land on a spring which will represent our rigid body uh, in this case. Once it makes contact with that spring, of course, then it's going to compress the spring by some amount delta until, they, until the whole system comes to a rest at some new, uh, new compressed position um, you know, where delta is a maximum that it's going to reach. The spring has a spring constant k, and we have this, the, the mass has a weight w, uh, and so forth. So we can start to analyze the system by looking at the energy of what's happening, right? First, we can say that there's potential energy change, right? As this weight moves down, it travels through a distance h and also a distance delta uh, till it you know, reaches a new at rest position. So it has a change in energy of that potential energy and it's weight force times distance. So weight times h plus delta. So this is that change in potential energy energy that we observe. Now, you know, we could also consider the kinetic energy, which is, you know, the, the speed at which it's traveling. However, we can kind of bypass that if we say it starts from rest at some height and ends at rest when the spring is compressed. So we can kind of bypass that, that moving state and just go between the two stationary states. Now, the change then is we're storing energy in that spring. So we need the, the stored energy within the spring, which we have an equation for 1 half k delta squared. So this is the, the energy that we store within the spring, um, that, that change of potential energy has been transferred into the spring. So we can equate those two things. Now, there's a couple things I want to define before we move on too far from this. Uh, I'm just going to do that over here. One is I want to define what we'll call an equivalent force. And this equivalent force is going to be equal to K delta. And basically this is the, the equivalent force that we would apply to the spring in a static loading scenario that would depress the spring by the same amount delta um, as the, the, the falling box would. So taking that, that energy of the box or the weight and saying, well, let's pretend it was static. We'll give that uh, what we'll call the equivalent force. And then another thing that I, a uh, relationship that I want to spell out is that we can equate the weight to something we'll call the static deflection. So again, taking this, this scenario that suppose we took that, that box and just set it nicely, slowly, on the spring, it would deform the spring by a certain amount delta, which we'll call delta ST for delta static, uh, which would presumably be less than delta, right? Because the box is not moving with the velocity, we're just setting its weight on there. So we kind of have these two scenarios. One, we're equating the moving weight, W, um, with... Uh, an equivalent force based on how much it, it deflects the spring um, while it's moving at a velocity. And then we have this static deflection, which is if we just set the box nicely on the spring, um, how much we would expect it to deform as a result. And that'll become useful um, as I work through these, these other equations. So if I go back then and take my, my energy balance, I can substitute in uh, from this second relationship, k you know, is going to be equal to w over delta st. So I can substitute in and get 1 half delta squared over del oops, delta st times w. 
as a relationship. And if you look at this equation and think about it in terms of delta, which is really the, the, the changing or unknown variable in this case, the one we can't just, you know, you, we can't just uh, get um, directly, then we see that it's in a quadratic form, right? There's a delta on the left-hand side and a delta squared on the right-hand side. So without walking through all the math, we can solve that quadratic equation. And what we get is delta is equal to delta st times 1 plus the square root of 1 plus 2h over delta st. And these are all static quantities. So this is uh, a useful equation for us. And it gives us uh, the ability to determine, you know, based on how high the box is and what its static deformation delta st would be, you know, what we can uh, expect to, to deform the spring due to that motion. We can also, you know, based on this equation over here, Fe equals k delta, we can rewrite this in terms of Fe, so get that equivalent force, which basically turns a dynamic problem into a static problem. We can rewrite this equation and get W1 plus square root 1 plus 2H over delta ST. And great, now we have a relationship between uh, the static and dynamic scenarios. And you, if you look at this first equation, you see delta on the left is dynamic, delta ST on the right is static, and then we have this thing in parentheses. And for the force equation, we have our static equivalent, so Fe, and uh, which represents a dynamic scenario, and then we have the weight, which is presumably a known value. And what we find then is that we have this quantity which is common between these two equations, which is the, the quantity in parentheses here, and we call this our impact factor. So effectively what that means is that it's a magnification, uh, a multiple of the static scenario W or delta ST, which gives us the dynamic scenario delta or force equivalent. So it's, it's kind of a, a multiplier um, which gives us or, or allows us to account for um, that scenario. Now sometimes we may not know the height from which something's falling, but we may know a velocity. So a good example with this, of this would be like you're swinging a hammer and then you, you strike something. The, the height from which the hammer is falling doesn't really make sense, right? That's, that's not really a, a thing in that regard. But we could know the velocity of the hammer right before it strikes uh, the rigid body. So maybe we want to formulate our equations in terms of velocity rather than change in height. Well, again, if we go back to basics of, of energy, so I'm just going to kind of separate my window here. If we go back to the basics of energy, we can write that V squared equals 2GH. So this is just equating uh, MGH and 1 half MV squared you know, potential and kinetic energy, and then and then striking out, you know, the common terms and, and solving for V squared. If we do that, then we can rewrite our equations as this, 1 plus square root, 1 plus V squared over G delta ST. And same for force equivalent, 1 plus square root 1 plus v squared over g delta st. So this gives us a, a slightly different formulation. All it really changed is the, the values that go into our impact factor um, to be in terms of velocity rather than, you know, height off of our, off of our object. So useful in, in some scenarios. There's a couple of uh, simplifications or, or special scenarios uh, for this that we might want to consider. One is that suppose we have something which we might call a suddenly applied load. Oops, that's not at all anything. 
So a suddenly applied load would be, you know, if you go back to that, that, that picture on the left of the screen, we have this, this weight um, dropped from a distance. Suppose we reduced H until it was zero. And we basically are just hovering the box right over the spring, and then we let it go. So there's no change in height, there's no initial velocity, and, and all of those terms drop to zero. Well, then basically what we end up having, as you can see from our impact uh, factor equation, if v is zero, then this term goes to zero. We have square root of one, which is one. One plus one is two. So all of that really is just to say that in this special case of a suddenly applied load, the impact factor is equal to two. So that can give us a sense of, of what we might expect to find um, for, for what this impact factor would typically be. So in a suddenly applied load, we have an impact factor of two. So no initial velocity, no initial height. We just sort of release the weight onto our thing or, or release the object. Okay. Scroll down to give me some, some white space. Now, we can simplify this equation a little further, which allows us to do some more things. Uh, often, we would expect h to be much, much larger than delta st. So if we drop something from a, from a fairly significant height, our, and our spring is sufficiently stiff, you know, it doesn't have to be a spring, it can be literally like a table or something, is sufficiently stiff, we would expect that deformation to be very small, right? Much, much smaller than h. And if we have a large number next to a small number, um, you might recognize from some math courses that that usually means we can cancel some things out because they're effectively negligible, right? So if we do that, we can say delta st then is equal to delta, or excuse me, delta is equal to delta st square root 2h over delta st. So I've canceled out some terms based on that being small. And I'm going to do some mathematical um, reorganization here. Basically, if I pull the delta st out, um, you know, divide it by the delta st, I have a power of 1, power of 1 half in the uh, denominator. Um, and what I end up with is I can move that delta st inside my square root and using my substitution from before I have delta st v squared over g as another formulation of this equation and I can substitute or rewrite v squared as kinetic energy so 2 I'm putting these squiggly lines around kinetic energy so we don't confuse things in a minute here. So 2 times kinetic energy over spring stiffness K, making some additional substitutions. So now I have an equation in terms of energy, which might be useful. And doing the same thing for my equivalent force, I can write 2H over delta ST. Again, doing some rearranging and substitution because delta st is equal to w over k. That's an important thing to remember. And if I substitute that in, I can write this equation as 2whk. I could write this as v squared kw over g which then gives me a similar formulation in terms of energy of 2 Ke times spring constant K. So now I have a formulation in terms of uh, kinetic energy, 2 times kinetic energy times K. Um, it gives me that, that force equivalent. Okay, now probably the whole reason for doing any of this is to figure out what my stress impact on my stress is. So if I want to know what's going on with stress, 
due to this impact loading, I can take my normal stress equation, but now I'm using my equivalent force uh, over a unit area. Um, a, a good way to think about this problem is suppose I have a bolt or something pinned and it has a mass around it and that mass is falling and it's going to strike um, this thing that's holding it up and I have a cross-sectional area in here, great. I can apply and figure out what my stress is um, using this normal equation. And if I do some rearranging based on my calculations that I have up here, then I can rewrite this equation as square root 2 times kinetic energy times Young's modulus over A L, so cross-sectional area times length. You'll see why I put these squiggly lines around kinetic energy, otherwise it would get confused with Young's modulus E. And this, of course, would also be equivalent to 2 kinetic energy, Young's modulus. A L is just volume, so I can look at how that stress is distributed through the volume of, of my part. Great. So now I have a formulation for stress based on kinetic energy, um, you know, velocity of my thing, one half mv squared would be kinetic energy, and Young's modulus, which is a material property, and volume, which is just representing my geometry. And if I rearrange and solve this equation, I get another quantity basically just solving for kinetic energy, I get stress squared volume over 2 times Young's modulus. And this quantity is called the impact energy capacity. And really what it's doing is it's saying if I have a, a limit for my stress, so if I take sigma and I substitute in my material's stress limit, I can calculate then how much energy my rigid body can absorb. So what is its capacity for absorbing that load energy? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there.